one does have to find an actual repulsive cushion if you want. And so this, saying it this way, just making it explicit, makes the answer much clearer. Because what you can see is that a large part of the expansion of the universe is, in a language that Professor Ellis has been using, an initial condition. It's not a force that we need to disturb in the galaxy. It merely is the way the universe started off. Then the question is, as Professor Ellis said, how did the galaxy uh, collect itself, pull itself together enough to stop this expansion? But once it's formed, it's just not expanding. Yeah. On the other hand, of course, if you incorporate the time object constant, that is a real pushing force and must have some, albeit very rather small, effect on the galaxy. And what it does is to make the galaxy very slightly larger than Great. it would have been yeah. if there was no cosmological constant, even if it's a few structures. And it makes the Earth a little bit larger. Maybe a little bit larger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with what you said, but I don't think it addresses this issue. I was asking specifically this joining of Schwarzschild. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you really wanted to address that specific uh, question. Robinson Walker. And the thing is, I heard all this from the kind of people who do not believe in black holes. So, in fact, I perhaps. Huh. Professor Ellis might want to express his opinion about people like Matola, Laughlin, uh, oh. Chaplin, <laughs> and these people. Laughlin's a great physicist, but he's gone off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> I get emails from these people who, who bombard me by saying that the whole black hole business is all pigment. Well, okay. uh, it's, it's like many of these other things, it's like AIDS. <laughs> People who say it don't exist, there always will be. There people always deny special relativity. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the black hole, the basic structure was determined in the 1965, 1970, and there's been no question about it ever since then. Uh, the physical existence of them is a completely separate issue, and, uh, and so on. But, um, <coughs> but in any case... Um, so where is Shooking's paper? I want to read this paper. Where is Shooking's paper? I can't, I'd have to look it up, I'm afraid, but okay, um, um, I may, actually I may have it, I'll, I'll have to find it for you. But um, Schuching did a paper in about the 19, Einstein and Strauss is about 47, Schuching did something on it in about 1957 or 1960, and there hasn't been much written on it since then because basically nobody has thought, from the relativity side, has thought there was anything more to do. I mean. Uh, um, from the astrophysical side, there's a serious question, where do you draw this boundary? Yeah. But, but, but from, the, from, from the mathematical side, the solution exists as an exact solution. And in fact, what uh, I tell you who has done quite a lot about this is Charles Dyer of Toronto. He has used these models, these models have been used, the um, Swiss cheese models, to look at things like gravitational lensing, structural formation. So Charles Dyer has done some very interesting papers looking at this in which he creates hierarchical structures, because uh, let me just say something about this, because it's actually quite fun. If you take a patch, here is a patch of a Robertson Walker model, so that's Robertson Walker, and here is Schwarzschild. Now you draw a boundary there and a boundary there, and you've got to match them, they must have the same metric. Okay, now, what you can do is you can match that to that, but you can do it in two different ways. You can take this, um, cut this out, and then put this in. But if you've got the conditions right to do that, you've also got the conditions right where you can do it the other way and you have got a patch of Schwarzschild expanding in a, in a Schwarzschild. Because if the conditions are okay that way, they're okay that way. And that means what you can do it is you can do it hierarchically. You can take a patch of a Robertson Walker and identify, say, this bit of Schwarzschild goes in there, but then you can do it the other way, so in there, that, that is Robertson Walker, that's Schwarzschild, that's Robertson Walker, and you can do a hierarchical structure like this if you want to, which is what Charles Dyer has been doing recently to make nice models of the fact we know there are hierarchical structures in the universe. So that's quite fun, actually. But it's just very, very neat. If you get the, the, the junction conditions right, because you can put this one and that, you can also put a bit of this one in that way, and you've actually done two problems at once, which is a thing that really appreciate. Okay, um, any other questions? Right. Oh, sorry, I want to say one thing. I, I thought when I started this that the people would know from general relativity, but apparently that wasn't really the case. No. So next year in this course, you should think of a crash course parallel to that, a four-lecture course, the principles of general yeah. relativity in four lectures. We're in uh, and I will do a small advertisement. I spent a lot of time with my friend Ruth Williams putting together a book called Flatten Curve Space Times, 
which tries to explain the special relativity you're seeing over there and the essence of general relativity to explain as much as you could without using um, calculus. And it's really quite a nice book in terms of explaining special relativity and the geometrical foundations of general relativity. In this connection, can I just say something since uh, Professor Ellis brought up this unevenness <coughs> of the uh, I Right after the Cultural Revolution in China, there was a summer school in China, and of course the students were complete mess. And so what the organizers did is that they had a school and a preschool. So there was a something like a three-day preschool, which all the students were brought up to the same level before the school started. That was very helpful. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. So I have a I think it's proportional to the divergence of the electric part of the right hand side. Okay, so that means you have gravitational entropy, which wants things to get in from the here. So we have that. And you have the other entropy, which wants things to spread out to get in from the here. Yes. So how do those interfere? How does? How do they interact, or which one is going to win? Well, that's the standard theory of structure formation. It basically comes down to the genes length. If you're bigger than the genes length, gravity wins. If you're smaller, the, the, the gas wins. So on. Uh, <laughs> To my mind, it, it, it really is a very, very puzzling kind of thing. Either with gravity turned on, the, the, the second law doesn't apply, no matter what Eddington said, or it applies with the opposite effect to what all the standard textbooks say. And that really, um, uh, uh, so, somewhere there's a change of sign with crucial effects for the existence of life in the universe, and it's not discussed almost anywhere excepting in Roger Penrose and one or two other small places. Oh. Sorry? Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Does it also mean that this uh, common thing in textbooks about the heat death of the universe is nonsensical? Uh, no, that's slightly different. That's talking about the far future, and that's the idea that as the universe, if it expands forever, everything gets.